So uh, uh, thanks uh, to the organizers for the invitation. So Poonam um, uh, has already uh, roughly told what I am going to talk about, what energy regime. So here we are going to talk about high energy astrophysical neutrinos. And you can see that it's a, in the ice cube. So I'll talk mainly about ice cube because the main interesting results are from ice cube in this sector. So first of all, uh, we have understood uh, from Unam's talk that we have uh, know fair little bit of uh, neutrino physics, at least at lower energies. So we know the mass square differences, mixing angles, etc. And so uh, what else we can learn from astrophysical neutrinos? That is the question. So first of all, if we understand properties of neutrinos at low energies within core, uh, then we can first of all use that knowledge to do neutrino astronomy. And neutrino astronomy has essentially two roles. First of all, to point back at the sources and then to know more about the sources. And we have successfully done uh, neutrino astronomy for solar neutrinos. The standard solar model was established uh, when we have studied solar neutrinos. So, and we will talk about many interesting results which have come up recently. Uh, but on the other hand, we can use this uh, neutrino telescope to probe physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. And then, first of all, the compared to the collider kind of environments, so the challenge here is that we do not have any control on the incoming flux of the astrophysical neutrinos. We do not know where they come from, so only there are some estimates like Boxman and Bakal, we will talk about it. And, but however, we can think of some guaranteed flux, which is the cosmogenic neutrinos, but no, so far no event has been observed till date. So that is one of the main challenges. And there are also very few, uh, the statistics is limited. There are very few events, more than uh, a PEV or so. So, and that, needs a large detector, but however, the neutrino nucleon cross-section also increases at higher energy, so that saves a little bit. So essentially, at the end of the day, you can just start with neutrino telescope with uh, just a one kilometer cube detector like an ice cube, so, uh, so that you can get roughly 10 to 50 events per year. So that was the goal, but right now we have sort of achieved, we have seen some astrophysical neutrinos, so we had then looking for the next step, uh, building the uh, ice cube Gen 2 detector, which will come up later. Okay, so here, I mean, this is the slide I normally show, but you know, basically we want to see astrophysical objects at different energy scales, so that different dynamics are apparent by observing the same thing, the Crab Nebula at different wavelengths. And we want to do it for example, with neutrinos, we do not know how it looks like. So I will actually uh, briefly review uh, the multi-messenger astronomy. So I'll be a little bit fast. So, but anyway, some things had been uh, covered by Ranjan as well as Unam. So I can skip uh, quite a few of them. So this is the cosmic ray spectrum. And we see very high energetic cosmic rays. Their R bars are really impressive. But the problem is we do not know where they come. And that uh, sad story would be perhaps compensated by if we can see neutrinos at very high energies. But of course, we can, in principle, we can see very high energetic uh, cosmic rays by pointing back at the sources. But so far, Auger didn't give us any statistically significant uh, phenomena so far. So, uh, but only motivation for this slide here is that if we see cosmic rays, we should expect that some high energy neutrinos should also come. And also you see, uh, basically the, you see here, it's multiplied by e to the power 2.6. So the, it's a power law, but a different uh, strength so that, you know, you have uh, numbers from minus 2.6 to three, like that kind of power law we are talking about. And then I'll also tell you why we expect a power law in the first place. So uh, first of all, we, uh, uh, I'm not going in deep into this kind of non-thermal acceleration mechanisms, but 
the farming acceleration in first order is the most promising here because it shows that the, the energy gain when it interacts, the charged particles interact with the shock waves, it is proportional to V by C rather than V by C square in the uh, second order, so that this pro uh, process is more efficient. And uh, here, if you uh, make some assumptions, it gives you a flux like E power minus two. And that, that is without taking into account um, the energy losses and other things. So if you take those things, you can change it to like 2.3 uh, minus three, so that you can roughly can get that kind of power law which is expected uh, from cosmic ray spectrum. So we are happy that we have some mechanism which can explain the power law behavior. So this I'm skipping. This is basically the same thing when it interacts with the shock wave. So this plot was shown by Kunam also. So you see here why I'm showing this plot because these are the entire neutrino spectrum and we are talking, going to talk about this extra galactic neutrinos and you can see roughly at 100 TeV, it supersedes the atmospheric neutrino background. So basically we'll be interested in neutrinos which have energies more than 100 TeV. So, and then uh, why first of all, we can do neutrino astronomy because neutrinos can come to you uh, unhindered by any other like dust and other things. Whereas cosmic rays can scramble in the magnetic fields and lose their directions. Whereas for gammas, that is interesting because you cannot see, um, I mean, traditional astronomy is based on looking at photons from radio waves to gamma ray photons, which after 10 TeV, basically the uh, photon astronomy is quite useless if you are talking about extra galactic uh, astronomy by photons. And there also neutrinos can save. You can see here the energy scales we are talking about. You have an ice cube sitting at the South Pole and the energy ranges, they work is huge. Uh, here you have just cosmic rays, you have just photon spectroscopy, just you can see the range from radio telescopes to photon still in this range, whereas neutrino telescope works in huge range of uh, neutrino detectors. But, and also, as I told you that the photon basically um, cannot travel much. So for example, for a photon of 80 TeV, uh, the mean free path is just three uh, mega per sec. And for one PeV, uh, which is interesting for us, it is just compared to, uh, compared to the galactic center. So if you uh, see, more photons than it's extra galactic. That's the sort of scales we are talking about. Now with that, first of all, why we expect neutrinos as I told you, because uh, normally in astrophysical environments, the photons can interact with the background photons or the protons itself, and they produce this charged pions and neutral pions. Neutral pions gives you light in terms of the photons and the charged pions gives you neutrinos which you observe. So you expect basically cosmic rays, uh, photons and neutrinos. And um, here also you see that uh, from these ratios, it, uh, you expect that at source, the ratio should be one is to two is to zero. However, there are some uh, extreme scenarios where some of the beams can be uh, blocked and other things. So muons can be blocked or other things. So there are some other extremes, which are non-standard uh, sources but I'm going to talk about it later. And this is perhaps the most interesting slide. I wanted to come to this slide. And this basically has enough information to convince you that what we are going to do today is actually things are falling in place. Why? Because these are the neutrino spectrum. And this, you can see right now what people do that they just simply uh, fit a fixed power uh, power power law flux with the whatever data they have, and they have some fits. And for high energy starting event, they have such a steep flux. And for these tracks, only for you have a little bit flatter curves and so on and so forth. But what is important here that how these neutrino fluxes are compared with the cosmic ray flux here and the photon flux here. So. Maybe I'll just take some time to explain this plot. Here, you see what people do that they take some E power minus two flux, which you, I mean, you expect from cosmic acceleration and then they do the GZK cutoff mechanism and 
then they try to saturate whatever cosmic ray you see at here so that you can expect, you can estimate the maximal number of neutrinos that is expected at the ice cube. And, uh, and if you do that, and then you can see that if you in principle assume that all such protons are giving entire energy to the pions and then uh, all uh, uh, pions are blocked so that maximal number of neutrinos are produced, then you get this estimate, which is known as the waxman buckle uh, estimate, which is the maximal number of neutrinos roughly you should expect. And you see this much amount of neutrinos you are actually seeing. So it is in the right ballpark. And um, also you can see here because of the GZK mechanism, you can see that there are some cosmogenic neutrinos which is produced, which I'll explain. And uh, so this, we do not have any events so far, we have not seen, and that's a challenge a little bit. And also here you see that the, you, this is what the photon flux you see from Fermilat uh, observations, gamma ray observations. And if you look at this, basically this is the saturation, uh, I mean, this is the uh, absorption uh, when they face the other photons. But if you take this uh, power law and this power law, you extend it, then you roughly get what you are observing in the right ballpark. So it, this plot just gives you the confidence that whatever cosmic rays you see, whatever neutrinos you see, and whatever photons you observe, gamma ray photons, they are in the right ballpark. So things are okay right now. And uh, why, first of all, uh, you expect this kind of power law, you, you see, because just you go back to basic particle physics. And if you uh, do some uh, hand waving back of the envelope calculations, you can arrive at this result uh, where you can see it relates the neutrino flux, the proton flux, which are basically the cosmic ray flux, and the photon flux. And you see that the power law is essentially the same. So essentially what uh, you do that when cosmic rays are interacting and other things, basically you expect the same power law everywhere, although the energy is shifted somewhere else, are uh, somehow degraded, uh, because you can see that um, here it is the waxman buckle flux, and uh, it's an upper limit in a sense that the source is thick, it produces the maximum neutrino flux and so on. Okay. So now let me talk about why we expect the cosmogenic neutrinos and uh, the protons on their way to the earth, they can interact with the background photons. And you can show that, um, that after CMB people have realized, these people have realized that this threshold is like 10 power 20 electron volts. So once that energy threshold is hit, so then these are uh, very drastically absorbed. So you see a cutoff um, and, uh, and that, is, that was reflected in the cosmic ray spectrum also. But what I wanted to show you in this thing that once you take the, again, the basic particle physics um, energy distributions and so on, you roughly expect that these cosmogenic neutrinos carry only the 5% of the parent protons energy. So roughly, if you see the uh, extreme energy uh, spectra, energy limit of that uh, cosmic ray spectrum, then you can expect uh, the cosmogenic neutrinos at the level of EEVs, and which we have not seen. So uh, the first of all, why that is happening that there are many other uh, explanations, but uh, roughly mm, you can see that mm, even the most pessimistic, uh, uh, I think it should be pessimistic model. So <laughs> most pessimistic uh, models are expected to yield, pessimistic models are yield to at least one event per year at ice cube, which we have not seen so far. And so that some people believe that it's a real trouble, but um, there are explanations like uh, the uh, cosmic, uh, this uh, cosmic ray, uh, is not purely proton, but these perhaps heavier nuclei. So per nucleon, it carries less energy. So 
that is one way to uh, explain things. And there are actually the uh, cosmogenic neutrino model building is quite difficult because there are many components which actually contribute ultimately to the cosmogenic neutrino flux. And there are roughly three components. So cosmogenic, the protons basically inter can interact with the uh, CMB photons. And then it can also interact with the rest of the extra galactic uh, background radiations. So there are uncertainties in that uh, individual ratios and perhaps this model is already ruled out. This is too optimistic. Okay. Here, then I do not have much time, so I'll just um, uh, proceed very fast. Uh, so in, uh, because the distance is huge, the neutrino oscillations are averaged out and you expect roughly one is to one is to one neutrino flavor ratio at ice cube. And this, uh, this is one of the handles, how you, I mean, handle new physics. So uh, if you uh, rather start with a source distribution of x, one minus x and zero, where x can lie anything between zero and one. So you can see these two plots are show, I am showing to give you a hint how this present ice cube and the future ice cube gen two compares with each other in the sense that these are the part, uh, present best fit, uh, I mean, one sigma uh, compute limits. And you see these are all allowed right now, wherever when you switch on the gen two and you run it for 10 years or so, so then perhaps the, it would be much more constrained. And this flavor ratio means you have, you may have or may not have the energy dependence of the flavor ratio. In standard scenario, you do not have energy dependence of the flavor ratio but you integrate over energy and then you make this plot. So these are known as flavor triangles, which you can draw for uh, most new physics scenarios. One, uh, this is standard neutrino nuclear oscillation cross sections. Only one thing I just like to mention that in the standard uh, neutrino uh, nuclear cross section, you expect a uh, uh, spike because of the glacial resonance. So, so far it was not being observed, many papers were written why it was not observed, but right now there are few candidates. And so perhaps we are seeing the glacial, glacial resonance around 6.6 6 PV or so, 6.3 PV. Okay, so these are actually, this plot is given just to show you how uncertain we are about the new neutrino nucleon cross sections today, because I mean, we do not have much events over a PEV or so, but below a PEV, neutrino nucleon cross sections are quite well known because Hirag and present LHC, LHC has, given, given an, has done a nice job so that the uncertainties in the partner cross sections are a uh, little bit, uh, I, mean, it's, I mean, you can handle it very nicely so that all partonic uncertainties are above of one PEV neutrinos which we have not observed. I mean, the statistics is rather poor. So, but that helps you to know the neutrino nucleon cross section because theoretically you know it rather precisely. Ice cube also helps you to uh, uh, estimate the neutrino nucleon cross section. This is the present day picture, you know, nicely uh, covered by these people. So you see, these are the events. You can see the amount of error bars if you take the tracks, it is this error bar. If you take the showers, it's this. And if you take the high energy, so it is roughly in this regime we are measuring and it is in the left electron energies. But in future, we can measure actually neutrino cross sections, which are, would be accessible even to the FCCs, but that is for the future. And roughly, basically, if you want an estimate, the neutrino nucleon cross sections would be known at 50% at very highest energies, but we are still, we have not seen those neutrinos. So right now, nothing can be said about it. And so here I'm basically uh, telling you, how much time do you have? Five minutes. Five minutes. So I'll then go very fast. So you see here, I'm talking about different neutrino nucleon cross sections and different proposals are there. So one proposal is that uh, if you have solar on trans trans uh, transitions, then around 90 V or so, then the solar on transitions, the, there are actually some standard results by Klinghammer and Manton, and then Tai and Wong has recently 
um, challenge those results. And then John Ellis has written a couple of papers, which basically down the line, in, uh, it tells you that about an energy of 10 power nine or so, then these cross sections would be more dominant and then basically can increase the neutrino nucleon cross sections. Whereas there is another scenario, this is the gluon saturation, which you expect that somewhere down the line that if you increase more energies and then gluons are basically, I mean, if you go to low X and Q square less than say MW square or so, then there would be more gluons and more gluons. So gluons would basically saturate and then gluons would uh, screen themselves so that you, the effect of, of having more and more gluons inside the nucleons would be saturated. And so basically that would decrease the uh, gluon pattern distributions and then it would also decrease the cross sections. So again, that needs to be seen whether we are seeing that there are other scenarios like production of microscopic black holes that can increase the cross section. So I am just um, uh, not going through that, but if there are extra dimensions, the TV scale, the Planck scale comes down to the basic Planck scale, fundamental Planck scale comes to the Planck scale, and that helps you to produce enough number of microscopic black holes. So if your collision impact factor is less than the Schwarzschild radius, then you can really produce them, which then uh, decay by Hawking evaporation and can give you fantastic events like, you know, there are different event topologies, which new topologies they can see in ice cube. So far, we have not seen any one of them, but that is just for to show you that there can be new event topologies. So these slides I'm skipping, uh, there are uh, different new tau, tau oscillations. So Ranjan has roughly mentioned it last time. So this also has been mentioned by Poonam. So here also you see that basically uh, how today LHC can compete with uh, ice cube. Sometimes ice cube does a better job. So if you look at the, it's a fixed target experiment. So this formula is valid. So one PEV of neutrino hitting uh, a proton of one GeV basically means you have a 1.4 TeV of center mass, center of mass energy. So basically it can compare, it can be compared with the one PEV neutrino basically means that you are basically at LHC. However, there are different ways of uh, going ahead. So, you know, there are different estimations of the neutrino nucleon cross sections. Uh, one is by the track events and one is by shower. And for shower, you take basically, you take different directions where the neutrinos travel through art, take different cross sections so that it becomes, I mean, sensitive to the cross section, neutrino nucleon cross sections. So, uh, and at the end of the day, basically you can uh, probe non-standard interactions of uh, neutrinos with nucleons at ice cube. Uh, and here basically one glimpse you can see the toy model I'm just talking about. So for example, a neutrino can talk to a Z prime boson and the quarks can also talk to a Z prime boson. And in that kind of a scenario, you can have non-standard interactions of uh, neutrinos with uh, the quarks. So these are actually the bounds, present bounds from LHC. And uh, if you take the MZ prime mass to be five GV, I have skipped actually the other phenomenological constraints on these models in the last slide. But if you see that the present bound, if the present bound from LHC is like this, and then the ice cube bounds are one order less, uh, if you take it to be the within the one sigma. And this, uh, uh, plot helps you to compare the LHC and uh, ice cube. So the pink uh, portion is excluded from LHC, whereas in other regions, you see the ice cube wins. So ice cube can exclude better regions. And it's because LHC is sensitive basically to this kind of energy regimes. They have more acceptance here, but for others, ice cube is better. Uh, this is another example of doing some non-standard, uh, I mean, how the non-standard physics can help you to do neutrino astronomy now. So this is an example where you have non-standard interactions between neutrinos and dark matter. These kind of interactions are important to uh, explain, for example, Hubble, uh, uh, Hubble tension and so on and so forth. So here, uh, if you have, basically this is a principle like what you have used in solar neutrinos. In solar neutrinos, 
you see, because the neutrino interacts with inside the sun, it can do matter effects and so on. So you know, you can verify the standard solar model. The same principle, if neutrinos can interact with dark matter, the neutrino can probe the dark matter profile of uh, distant astrophysical sources. Now, uh, here we have proposed that it would be actually embedded into the energy dependence of the flavor ratios, because, uh, I mean, um, if you have ultra light neutrino, ultra light dark matter like 10 power minus 20 electron on volts or so, then you can have a huge, in a huge number density so that the probability that the neutrino can interact with the dark matter would be more. And so that you can actually, you know, this ultra light dark matters can form a solitonic core of uh, dark matter. So that, and then rest would be dark matter halo. And this, uh, this profile looks like this. And if you have a profile like this, and this is actually a signature when people try to find out whether the dark matter is made of ultralight dark matter or not. The mass, you remember 10 power minus 20 electron volt or so. They try to see if they are forming a solitonic core or not. And that can be probed through matter effects of neutrinos. If neutrinos are going through that age of that solitonic core, then they can have adiabatic or non-adiabatic uh, matter effects are kind of scenarios here. You see. And from the energy dependence of the flavor issues, you can see the interiors, that means the dark matter profile of the uh, distant sources. And now I basically come, to, yeah, so I just come to the, I mean, recent results. So this is actually the recent successes of uh, pointing back to the, uh, Astro, uh, sources. So, uh, for example, neutrinos. One neutrino has been uh, has been uh, confirmed to come from a blazer, and then uh, looking at this blazer, then people found that in the archival data they found there are more neutrinos coming from that direction. That so the you can see the statistical significance here. It's three point five sigma. Then they have also found some tidal disruptive event where a black hole is eating out a star. So they are also one event they have observed, but recent result I want to just show you, flash you, it has come in the science uh, paper, uh, paper I mean, in November only. So there are actually uh, some 79 plus minus 20 odd neutrinos coming from a background of a blazer. Now this blazer is basically, it's not a blazer, but radio quite edgy and you do not have this jet coming out. So these are actually, this is the kind of sources actually you need to explain the amount of neutrinos you are seeing, because if you sum up the uh, kind of blazers or what you have seen in the sky, it doesn't count the amount of neutrinos you have seen. But this is actually a very promising result today, although the statistics is not that significant, like it's not five sigma, it's 4.2 sigma right now. Uh, but you see here that you know, why it's important because uh, you want some radio quite AGNs which are giving out neutrinos, which are perhaps cannot be explained by looking at the blazers alone. And at some point, uh, you also expect that there can be many sources of neutrinos with many other uh, kind of power laws. And what you see actually is the sum of all such power laws. And that kind of picture is right now emerging from this paper actually. So people can see a neutrino spectrum. If you believe that these neutrinos, there are some statistical things which are involved here. But that picture is now emerging. That is, a, so with the positive note, I am just, so I have actually talked about all these things. So I'm not taking any extra time <laughs> just going through this, but you can just look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Then you showed this extrapolated spectrum of uh, protons uh, by uh, looking at high energy cosmic rays and going back. Now, it, that seems to depend uh, very much on at what point you start fitting, what yes. energy allows you start fitting. Yes. So yeah, I could imagine you it becoming even one order of magnitude higher if you start fitting. So what, what decides at what, uh, at what energy onwards do you fit to the falling spectrum? Yes. So what they do actually, they try to fit that tail here just to saturate that you assume that 
all neutrinos you are seeing at this energy are purely from protons, although it's not. So this gives you an, uh, uh, an estimate of uh, oversaturating your limits. So you want actually the maximum amount of neutrino class. So first you assume whatever maximum, I mean, you know, cosmic ray you are seeing are actually protons. And then this difference is perhaps, you know, you can compare, I mean, this is, uh, you can think of, there are other um, heavier nuclei also. So that difference accounts for that. This is, I mean, desperately being done so that you can saturate the limits. Yeah, uh, following Amal's question there, actually, I think what would be the most important is to get the chemical composition of yes. ultra high. So, and very difficult. It's very difficult to do. And, uh, and there is a big debate there yes. going on between Auger there experiment is, and the telescope array experiment. There is no because problem. they see slightly different things. Uh, one sees more proton rich yes. composition, and the other sees the other iron rich. So, uh, unless that is this disputed, settled, we cannot. That, that, really that's say what something. would give the. If we can do that, then I think this would yes. become a better, yes. better yes. lot to do. Yes. Right now, it's a conservative estimate. Yeah, that's, that, that's true. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Ah, so, two, two quick questions. One is uh, in the slide of those phalerons, uh, isn't that like a temperature dependent quantity? Uh, can you simply have uh, high energy, uh, so like 9 TeV, for example, is the, you need to reach temperature of 9 TeV, right? No, uh, am I mistaken? Yeah, so basically here, um, 9 TeV means, um, yeah, the temperature should be in early universe, the temperature is 9 TeV. Mm -hmm. is in a collider, if you go, then it could be just 9 TV center of mass. Okay, okay. And secondly, uh, in the paper about uh, your work about solitons and their effects in uh, uh, neutrino oscillations, what is the typical size of the soliton core? Like, oh, that, I, that there is no, I mean, you know, we have just taken some specific numbers and we have just gone ahead. Here you see okay. the core size basically here is determined by the A, it's five mega per sec. Uh, okay, no, I, minus okay. no, I, 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 sorry, per sec, sorry. Yeah. So I was simply wondering about the effects of kinematic decoherence into this result. Uh, I do not know. I mean, yeah. So here, um, uh, it's basically these numbers are chosen because one of them gives you adiabatic and another there is analytic. These are two extremes. Okay. So these are basically what you are talking about. In between, there are these ratios. Right. Thank you. 